Hi everybody, welcome to session 2.3. We're continuing our discussion on grammar, talking this time about agreement and reference. Uh, within that subject, we'll talk about cases, we'll talk about subject-verb agreement, homophones and parallelism. Uh, then we're going to talk about tenses uh, for conjugation and numbers. Um, <clears throat> let's start off with agreement and reference. A case is, a, is the way a noun is used in a sentence. So cases are categories of how we use nouns within a sentence. Uh, most languages actually alter nouns to reflect their case, meaning that the noun itself actually changes sometimes with a suffix or something like that. English doesn't actually alter nouns to reflect their case, um, ex with one exception. We actually use word order and prepositions to indicate the case of a noun in a sentence. Uh, let me give you more clarity on this with some examples. These are the five most common cases used in the English language. The subject is the actor of the sentence, the company. The direct object is the object being acted on in the sentence, which would still be the company. Um, and the indirect object is acted to in the sentence or toward, and that would be to the company. Notice we use a preposition to indicate the case there. Um, the possessive is where the noun owns something, and in this case it would be the companies with an apostrophe S. Uh, and then the reflexive would be when the object is when the noun is the object of its own action, but we'd still just call it the company in that case. So notice that for four out of these five cases, uh, the noun stays the same and doesn't change. Uh, it's only with a possessive that we change the noun, and that's by adding the apostrophe S. Um, the first four, by the way, cases on this list are also known as the nominative case, the accusative case, the dative case, and the genitive case. Um, but uh, these are easier to remember. But you probably learned nominative, accusative, and so forth if you learned a foreign language. All right, so the basic rule is we keep nouns essentially the same unless they're possessive, no matter where we're using them in the sentence. The exception to that is that English, the English language does alter personal pronouns. Pronouns are substitutes for nouns. A personal pronoun is, is, is a pronoun for grammatical people. That's specific people in the sentence, but including it for animals and objects. So let's go back to my list of five cases. The, for first person singular, the subject of a sentence would be I. The direct object would be me. The indirect object would be to me. The possessive would be my, and the reflexive would be myself. Um, so you can see uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> the way this works in English. So, so here's the table showing how in English we alter personal pronouns based on their case. So first person singular is I, me, my. Second person, or sorry, first person plural is we, us, our. Second person, both for singular and plural, is you, you, your. Um, third person singular, depending on it, the gender of uh, the person or the nature of the object, if it's a, if it's a pet or an animal, or if it's, sorry, if it's an animal or an object, it'd be he, him, his, she, her, hers, it, it, it's, or if it's plural, third person, then it's just they, them, theirs, no matter the nature of the, of, uh, the noun. Now, this might seem strange. Why in the world are you learning this? It's because it's good to understand this in relation to common mistakes made as they relate to pronouns in the English language. Uh, for example, it's improper to use pronouns when they're not precise. Um, the first sentence, Jim's boss said he had to finish the reports first. We don't know who has to finish the reports because of the pronoun is imprecise there. We don't know if it's Jim or the boss that has to finish the reports. And so we need to avoid pronouns to add precision. So we change the sentence to read Jim's boss said Jim had to finish the reports first. Now we know it's Jim that has to do the reports. Um, another common mistake is that we miss is that pronouns are misused relative to their case. So here we have a sentence where the pronouns are the subject of the sentence. That's why it's incorrect to say that her and me went to the store after work. The correct grammar is she and I went to the store after work. Um, and uh, that's, that's an example of using pronouns in the subject of the sentence. In the object or indirect object of the sentence, this is another common mistake. People have learned that when they put themselves in a list in a sentence, that they should say I at the end of the list. 
um, to, to reflect themselves. That's not actually true. Um, because here, the, you, the, the first person singular is the object or in the indirect object of the sentence. And so it's incorrect to say that you gave it to her and I. You should instead say you gave it to her and me. The easy way to know that you're getting this right is to strike out everything except the reference to yourself. So to say you gave it to I doesn't make any sense. But to say you gave it to me does make sense. And that's why um, that, that's just a quick and easy way to tell if you're using the proper pronoun in the sentence. It's to strike out everything except for the pronoun in question, and then you know you're doing it right. Um, there is a special case, uh, and the grammarians in the class are going to cringe when I explain this, but uh, the, the, I'll explain the correct way first. Traditionally, they is plural, so it's not correct to say if you teach a person to fish, they can eat for a lifetime. The they in that sentence is referring to a person. They is plural, a person is singular, and so there's a mismatch between the pronoun and the noun being referenced by the pronoun. So they actually, the actual correct way is to say, if you teach a person to fish, he or she can eat for a lifetime. Because we don't know the gender of the person, it's appropriate to use he or she. You could, th there are some writing styles that say you can alternate the gender throughout your writing. So you could use just he or just she if you wanted to, even if we don't know the gender of the person. Um, but uh, that that's the correct way. However, they can be colloquially singular. So in colloquial usage, and that's just very in very, very informal usage of English, it's okay to say if you teach a person to fish, they can eat for a lifetime. Because saying instead he or she can eat for a lifetime might be more stuffy than your than than your audience uh uh would um, would allow you know if you're having just a casual conversation you might sound a little uptight if you insist on proper grammar and so it's okay to use they colloquially however in any of the assignments you use and you turn into my class you shouldn't be using colloquial language you should be using the formal formally correct grammar so make sure that you treat they as plural when you use it um, we also do change certain non-personal pronouns, specifically what are called interrogative pronouns. Uh, that's where we're trying to figure out something with the pronoun, like who or whom or whose. Uh, this brings us to another example, or two other examples of common mistakes with pronoun usage. You should not be using who, you, rather you should use who instead of that for people. So it's incorrect to say the police officer is the one that started it. That's incorrect. You should instead say the police officer is the one who started it because the police officer is a person, so you should use who instead of that. Um, again, we have another formal versus colloquial um, issue to cover. Who is only ever correctly a subject is never an object, whereas whom is only ever correctly an object is never a subject. So the top sentence, who should give it and to who should they give it, is incorrect because to who is using the subject where the indirect object, whom, should be used instead. So the correct version of that sentence is who should give it and to whom should they give it. Um, who can be used colloquial, the, colloquially, though, as an object. So when you're in an informal setting, using the word whom will make you sound stuffy, maybe even a little bit pretentious. So it's okay to say who should give it and to who should they give it if you're in a colloquial setting because whom might put off your audience. Okay, so that's it as far as pronouns and cases. We're going to talk next about subject-verb agreement. <clears throat> it's important to properly conjugate verbs for their subjects. In English, conjugation is universally very simple. Um, I eat, we eat, you eat, you all eat, he, she, it eats, and they eat. So what you can see is when we conjugate verbs in English, we essentially use the infinitive version of the verb, which is to and then the verb, like to and then the verb. And the only time we ever alter the verb is in the first third person singular, he, she, or it. There are exceptions like with irregular verbs like to be, where, you know, it's I am, we are, and so forth. But uh, <clears throat> those are not hard to remember because there aren't that many of them in English. So a common mistake is that um, verbs are sometimes misconjugated relative to their subjects. Uh, let me give you an example. <clears throat> 
It's incorrect to say a single subject separated from its verb by plural objects are often followed by a misconjugated verb. Um, now, you might want to pause here because what I love about this example is the sentence is explaining the rule, but also exemplifying misusing the rule. So <clears throat> the correct version of that sentence is a single subject separated from its verb by plural objects is often followed by a misconjugated verb. What happens is the subject of the sentence is singular, <clears throat> but then because of the way the sentence is structured, there's a plural object that appears right before the verb. <clears throat> you habitually see the S of the plural object, and then you want to conjugate it, the verb for a plural object, and uh, that's obviously a misconjugation. And so uh, it's important that you're aware of the subject of the sentence so you can properly conjugate the verb. Again, make sure that you pause the video if the sentence still doesn't make sense so you can read it through and, and make sense of it. Another common uh, mistake is relative to the word and. When you're combining subjects in a verb with and, then the verb becomes plural. So Annie and Jim has is incorrect. You should instead say Annie and Jim have the correct ad addresses for our new staff. Uh, and is plural. Each, however, is singular. Um, sometimes people conjugate the verb in a plural manner following the word each, and that's not correct. So you shouldn't say each of them have correct addresses for our new staff. You should say each of them has. Now again, them is plural, right? And that's why you're inclined to conjugate the verb in a plural way, but you shouldn't because each is the subject of the sentence. And when you're talking about each, you're talking about one individual at a time, not a group of individuals collectively. Uh, on the other hand, all is plural. So you say all of them, to say that all of them has the correct addresses is incorrect. You should instead say all of them have. Now all sounds better than each in most cases, so you should use all when possible. There are times when each is important for emphasis, and so you'll use that in language instead of the word all. But as a general rule, all is easier to understand. Now that brings us to the or. Or is kind of special. If you're ever using either or in a sentence or just the word or in a sentence, um, you conjugate it by default to singular unless one of the subject, at least one of the subjects is plural. So it's incorrect to say that either the policeman or the chief is losing this battle. Um, you might be inclined to conjugate that verb as singular because it's preceded immediately by the word chief, which is singular. But because policemen is plural, then we need to conjugate the verb in a plural way. So the correct usage is either the policeman or the chief are losing this battle. But if you said either the, the, either the uh, fire chief or the police chief, then you would use is instead. All right, let's talk about homophones. Homophones are words that sound alike, but that have different meanings. The most commonly misused uh, homophones are it's, meaning it is, and it's as a possessive. So it's as a, as a contraction of it is, is with the apostrophe. So it's incorrect to say it's under the desk without the apostrophe because you're, conj you're contracting it is. The correct version is it apostrophe s under the desk. Uh, it's without the apostrophe is the possessive version, so it's not correct when you're using, it's incorrect to say my car is on its last legs where you use an apostrophe. You should delete the apostrophe and do it's without whenever you're doing it's possessive. Here are a bunch of other examples of misused homophones, um, and it may be helpful for you to pause the slide to review all these, but um, Who's with the apostrophe and whose as an H O H W H O S E. Who's at the end of this line? Whose bag is this? There, 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 and there are three commonly misused uh, homophones. Um, two T O and two T O O are commonly misused. In fact, some usually it's because T O O is well. Actually, they're they're kind of misused. Uh, in both directions. Your possessive and your meaning a contraction of you are, those are very commonly mistaken for each other. Um, and you can read this sentence for an example of how to do that right. And then the word then, which is comparative, and then, which it relates to uh, time, 
Um, if you have more candy than I do, then I hope you share some with me. Okay, so those are some more examples um, <clears throat> of uh, homophones that will be helpful. And like I said, pause the slide if, if, it, um, if it makes it easier for you to uh, review those. Let's talk about parallel, parallelism now. Um, this is a really common mistake in writing. Um, essentially, when you're making a list or a comparison in writing, you, you need to use this a consistent word pattern across the whole list or throughout the comparison. So I'll give you an example of an improper list, an improperly parallel list. I will have to inspire you, to inform you, and show you how to be better writers. The reason that's correct, incorrect is because the verbs we've been putting, the infinitives we're putting in here, I will have to inspire you, to inform you. You'll notice that we're using the word to, which is the complete version of the infinitive. And then we drop the to with the verb show, and that makes it incorrect. The correct way is to leave the to in, so you're using the, the full infinitive version of the verb because you did it for inspire, you did it for inform, so you should also use it for show. So the correct way is to say, I will have to inspire you, to inform you, and to show you. Um, another example, kind of going a different direction on this, I will have to inspire you, to inform, and to show you how to be better writers. We kept the infinitive in all those cases, but we dropped the word you in the middle of the list. We, in, the, in the first sentence, we said inspire you and show you. And then we just said in form, we drop the word you. And again, that's not being parallel. So you need to say to inspire you, to inform you, and to better show you how to be, and to show you how to be better writers. Um, comparisons, you also need to make sure you are parallel. Um, the top sentence is incorrect. You can choose to either request a small amount now, or you can take a larger amount later. The reason that's incorrect is because the comparison starts with the word either. Um, and we need to make sure we're keeping it correct within the, from the comparison forward, we need to be parallel. So from the comparison forward, we just use a simple version of the verb request. Um, to say that you can, and then the verb take, is, is more than the parallel requires. So the correct version of that is you can choose to either, and now we start the parallel, request a small amount now, or take a larger amount later. So, so from the comparison forward, from the word either forward, we use the same word pattern. OK, <clears throat> let's move on now. We're going to talk about tense. Uh, tense is the changes we make in a verb to reflect when it happens hap to when it happens, happened, or will happen. Make sure you use proper tense. Uh, it's incorrect to say, see that you will not do any damage. It sounds formal and fancy, but it's not correct. Instead, you should say, see that you do not do any damage. Um, <clears throat> th th that's sort of simple. People don't make that mistake a lot. But, but here's a very common mistake, which is to, to follow a past tense with an infinitive. Sometimes people think it sounds more formal to say, I wanted to have been at the breakfast, uh, but one of my children was sick with the flu. That's incorrect. Um, you should be using the infinitive after the past tense. I wanted to be at the breakfast. That to be is this, is the infinitive version of the vor of infinitive version of the verb, and that's what you should use following the a past tense verb. Okay, so make sure that you uh, to, to have been by the way is the past unreal conditional tense. <laughs> for those who are curious, and that should always stand on its own. It shouldn't follow a past tense version of a verb. Um, past perfect. Uh, leads people into common mistakes. The past perfect is used to indicate something that happened before another thing in the past. Here's a correct sentence with the past perfect. He had learned several surprising things in the interview before we met with him. Met is the past tense version is the past tense verb in the sentence. Had learned is saying that it happened before the past tense thing that happened. So before we met, he had learned several surprising things. Um, the reason this matters is because people sometimes use the past perfect when they should just use the simple past tense. It's incorrect to say he had learned several surprising things in the interview. That, uh, it, that's using the past perfect as past tense, and that's not correct. You should just say simply, he learned several surprising things in the interviews. Um, <clears throat> 
we need to talk for a minute about the past tense and the past participle. Um, the past tense is where you conjugate the verb to reflect history, so Aaron ate too much junk food. The past participle is where you take the verb and convert it into an adjective, and so this sentence, the junk food was all eaten, eaten is not a verb anymore, now it's an adjective, and it's describing what happened to the food. Uh, was is actually the verb in that sentence, and it's in the past tense. The reason this matters is because people will misuse past participles. It's incorrect to say he drunk a great deal before the end of the cocktail party. Drunk is a past participle. It's not the past tense version of the verb. It's correct instead to say he drank a great deal before the end of the cocktail party. Uh, here's a list of commonly misused past participles. All the red ones are the past participles. All the green ones are the past tense versions of the verb. So he drank, he rang, he sang, he sank, he sprang, he swam. Uh, you shouldn't be saying he drunk, he rung, he sung, he sunk, he sprung, he swum. Uh, that's using the past participle instead of the past tense version of the verb. So a football announcer would say he really rang his bell. If, a f if you hear a football announcer say he rung his bell, he's that announcer is doing it wrong. You can say his bell was rung, um, and that's correct. Don't say his bell was rang because that's using the, p the past tense version of the verb as the past participle, which is flipping the error. Okay, now finally, lastly, we'll talk about numbers. Um, this is a really simple list of guidelines for you to follow when you're um, using numbers in your writing. Numbers above 10, don't spell them. Numbers 10 or below, you should spell out the number. Numbers at the beginning of sentences, you should always spell. Large number, so you never start a sentence with the numeric version of a number. It should always be the spelled out version of a number. You should always shorten large numbers. So when it's 7.2 million, make sure you say that um, instead of adding the trailing zeros. Um, and, uh, and when you're talking about pages, percentages, dates, or addresses, any of those four things, you don't spell the numbers. You always use the numeric version. So that's really simple. The, the, those are easy. You just have to sort of memorize those four observations, and then you'll get numbers right in, in your writing. Okay, that's it. I look forward to seeing you all in class, and we'll do the quizzes together and, and uh, illuminate these subjects even further.